There are so many different markup languages. I mean like YAML and JSON and XML. There are so many that I created this app to easily convert YAML syntax into JSON syntax, but it is vulnerable and intentionally designed to be hacked. The application is pretty simple. You just supply your own YAML syntax, maybe strings, maybe integers, maybe lists or other objects, and you go ahead and click convert, and then it will spit out all of the JSON syntax appropriate for that structure. This is some placeholder text, but of course it is all customizable. You could manipulate this, you could tweak it, you could really do whatever you really wanted to for the function and purpose of the application. But let's say I'm an ethical hacker. I'm a penetration tester, I'm a red teamer, I'm a bug bounty hunter, whatever. I wanna take advantage of this application and manipulate it to get code execution or compromise and control that server. Now, I will say this is a small task and an exercise and activity, a challenge that I created for the sneak fetch the flag CTF event that we ran just previously. This video, I want to show you the solution for this challenge. But here's the thing, the players of the Capture the Flag competition did not get the source code to the application. It was a black box test and they kind of had to figure it out based off of the description and everything that they're given for the challenge. Need to transform your YAML code into JSON? We've got you covered. Just find the flag in the root of the file system and you can start up the challenge and begin. First things first, if this is what we're up against, we should try to figure out and fingerprint, hey, what is this application made up of? Obviously, hey, we're in our web browser right now, I could try to view the source of the web page and we could zoom in on oh the HTML or like the hypertext markup language that's used to build this page but looks like there isn't anything interesting there's just some JavaScript code to handle okay retrieving and working with the results hey actually displaying that on the screen but it's still just static info all of the processing for the application the actual converting between our YAML syntax to JSON is all done on the server side and as a player we don't know what that is maybe we could do some googling some research search, can I look for YAML code execution or YAML hacking or anything that might clue us in on what we'll do with this application? Looks like there is even a blog from Sneak, so that would be worthwhile to check out, see if it's related to the task at hand. And this showcases that there are some issues in a lot of open source projects in different programming languages, Python, PHP, and Ruby. They showcase this, they discuss the deserialization process for how you actually marshal or work with the data provided in that markup language syntax. Here they showcase it in Ruby and they actually dig into, I think, like the Ruby GeoKits Rails library, one of the things here. Yeah. This showcases some proof of concept exploits or some syntax that we could use where we're actually triggering Ruby code on the backend server to get output of raw commands. Things like the ID command or just running bash syntax. The problem is we still don't know what this application is made up of. The sneak blog showcased it with Ruby as the backend, but I don't know if it's Ruby on this. Here's a little bit of a trick though. We could right click and inspect the page or just open F12 with our keyboard and break open the developer tool. With that, we could actually dig into some of the HTML elements that we saw on the page, work with the JavaScript console, or even just monitor the network traffic. If I were to refresh this page with the F5 button or Control Shift R, when we request the page, you can see I'm just testing this locally, so I have an HTTP GET request to localhost, we can examine in the actual response headers, you'll see a response server notice here that this is actually Python. It's running Python 3.11 as the version of the back end of the server. This is probably a simple lightweight Flask application. And that means it's probably running a Python library to work with YAML syntax and JSON syntax. So let's get back to Googling and let's look for like Python YAML code execution or exploits or hacks. We can Google search that. Looks like there are some great results from Hacktrix, good friends Carlos Pullup and all of their fantastic research and resources here. Take a look at everything they get into because they say YAML Python libraries are also capable of serializing whole Python objects and not just raw data. Like sure, we could work with a regular flat string, say LOL, but we could also work with different data types and even use some Python syntax to trigger that invocation here. We could even potentially call different functions if we were 
to use like an object apply and whatever function we might like. The thing is, this is very, very specific to how it is done in the application because the YAML library that you use, like PyYAML, see that capital P and then all caps YAML here, the methods that they use for loading some of this and the loader that they choose to use is where the key of the vulnerability comes in. And the function that you use matters. Functions or methods like safe load or safe load all use the safe loader and they don't support class object deserialization. They showcase a lot of the different syntax here, but they note, look, if you're using the unsafe load function, obviously that one can get a little bit hairy. They showcase this because in modern or more recent versions, anything above version 5.1 for the PyYAML module, it doesn't allow deserializing any Python class or attributes with loader on its own, or not being specified in the load function or setting safe loader as your loader of choice. Older versions of this PyYAML module were in fact vulnerable to deserialization attacks if you didn't specify the loader. If you just called the function like by default and didn't specify, hey, something safe for the full loader, you could be opening up yourself to that vulnerability. But in recent and modern versions, you can no longer call dot load on its own without specifying a loader, and that full loader option is no longer vulnerable to this attack. Okay, so now we're a little bit smarter. We know the potential mishaps, what could go wrong, and maybe this is vulnerable, but it's a capture the flag challenge. We know it's gotta be hackable. If you're interested, Hack Trick showcases a pretty cool tool from Jolt and Jolt GitHub that showcases, hey, this is a utility piece where you're able to create serialized payloads for deserialization RCE attacks with Python-driven applications where Pickle, PyYAML, or any of these other modules are in place. I'm not gonna showcase that in this video because I do wanna understand a little bit more of the manual syntax for our learning and education so we can see this in action. And let's try some of this, but you can see even the syntax here that they use, kind of similar to that sneak blog where you have two exclamation points and the language running as the back end where we can create other objects or even different data types like a tuple or even a string I think they saw above here. Yeah, look, they create an object new string. Now here's an interesting thing though, because in the example that they showcase, they use the popen or popen process open method out of the sub process module. That will work, it will run code and execute, but it won't immediately give us standard output. So for a quick and easy thing, just to be even able to see our code is running on the web page, let's try to use something different. Let's go back to our application, remove all of this and try those exclamation point python slash object slash apply. And then let's try with the colon to denote this, we can use something like os.system. And then I think it looked like underneath you can supply like a donating a new list or pieces and objects appropriate for that, could we try to just run something like id? Uh, let's run convert here and okay, it returns zero. Um, not exactly the output of our ID function or like who am I as we would like to run on the command line. That still gives us zero, but what if I tried something that does not exist? Like that's not a command you could normally run within Linux here. That should error or at least give us another error code that something is wrong. That failed and it did not work in executing that does not exist command. But even running commands that do work, like pwd gives us zero successful exit and return code, that isn't helpful because we can't see the output. So let's switch it up. Let's try to use something like that sub process module and it actually has a function called check underscore output. Now I could try to run this. We know the argument being passed in is PWD. Can I execute this? I'll hit convert. Uh, object of type bytes is not JSON serializable. Okay, so we are getting a response. The return value of check output just gives it in bytes, you know, like a string prefixed with B. So we kind of need to convert this to a string. Question is, can we do that? I think so, because we just saw previously, if we had a line similar to this above it, where we created a new object, we know that we can pass in arguments like with that style of just using a hyphen or a minus sign tack to specify, I actually want to include all of this inside of the string sort of constructor here, the function that we're calling, we're actually gonna be passing in the return value of our check output that is called with its own arguments of PWD. So I'll have to indent this. Let me add a couple spaces here to denote, look, that PWD argument goes to our check output function, but then it's like we're calling just regular Python code here. Can I run this? Let me hit convert. 
And there we go. We can see, even with the B prefix here, the home user. So we've successfully executed that command. We have code execution. We can exploit this, we can take advantage of it and compromise it, we can get a reverse shell, but in this case, the goal is pretty simple. We just need to read a file. But we have file inclusion because we can run arbitrary commands. We can even run Python code. We can do whatever we want. Just for our proof and validation, hey, we can run the ID command to see that output. Of course, we can run who am I, looking good. Maybe we could try something like, oh, just a sleep five to validate, will the server run here? But there's a problem. We have no such file or directory sleep five. The hiccup here is because there are spaces in the command. The check output method, or the function that we're calling from the subprocess module, really only takes one argument for what you want to invoke on the command line, run as a shell command in the terminal. But if you provide that as a string, it's presuming that that is like argv0 in the listing of arguments or the tokenized string on the command line. So if there are spaces, like we're providing other arguments or parameters or configuration switches, then it's not gonna see that, oh, as a binary within the path. Ultimately, we have to provide a list or a tuple. Actually, we can do that pretty easily, right? Because we saw, again, in that previous syntax, we could just pass in a Python tuple. Now that we're using a tuple or a list of arguments here, we could provide anything that we wanted to that includes spaces. We just have to separate them win the spaces with new entries in the listing here. So let's try to cat out flag.text. That's the command that we're running, passes a tuple into our check output function being cast as a string. Let's fire it up. Command cat flag return non-zero exit status one. Correct, because it's not in the current directory, right? We could see our PWD output we were in user, but it's in the root of the file system. So let's apply a forward slash at the very, very front of that. Let's try and run it. There it is, there is our flag. And we have solved that challenge. Super simple, we didn't even need a reverse shell because we were just a little bit smarter in how we would use the syntax here. Let me show you the source code to this application super quick because it is extremely easy. It's like 20 lines of code where I'm just using deserialized data from YAML load and just returning it as JSON, super duper simple. This is a vulnerability that Sneak would find automatically for you if you could show it the code. I'm in the current directory of all the source for the application, the Docker file, the source code, even the solve script. If I run sneak code test, it'll try to analyze this and let's see, can it track down that vulnerability? Ooh, looking good. Okay, test completed one high vulnerability, four medium and five code issues. There it is, high deserialization of untrusted data. It tells tells me the file where it found this flaw, even down to the line where the vulnerable function is called, and that unsanitized input from the web form flows into yaml.load, where it's used to deserialize an object, and that will result in an unsafe deserialization vulnerability. That is the capture the flag challenge to showcase vulnerable and unsafe deserialization of YAML data, even just spin it into, oh, JSON as the functionality and purpose of the application, but of course can be hacked. And Sneak would help you track down that issue. If you're interested in using Sneak to secure your own applications, there is a link in the video description. Huge thanks to Sneak for sponsoring this video, and I'm especially grateful for the opportunity to co-host that Capture the Flag with you. Thank you so much for watching, everyone. Hope you learned something, hope you enjoyed this video. Like, comment, subscribe if you did, and I'll see you in the next video.